Hi there, our highly valued, treasured and esteemed viewers, and listeners and welcome back to your channel of choice. This video I am about to present was compiled by Dr. Nath Arawa, a clinical pharmacist by training and profession who is the founder of Progressive Pharmacotherapy Consultants. The premier virtual clinical pharmacy institute for capacity building for healthcare workers. The Virtual Clinical Pharmacy Institute with a difference, where patient safety, medication therapy management and optimal clinical outcomes are very crucial and non-negotiable to us. Here we seek to remain your premier source of crucial tips for high-impact pharmacotherapy services. So, on behalf of the Institute, I humbly urge you all to sit back and spare me part of your very precious time to share with you very useful tips which may prove very, very handy in your line of duty. I now welcome you all to part 360 of our pharmacotherapy series, which majors in asthma. The first question reads, ROR, a 41-year-old man, presents to the clinic with a history of coughing and shortness of breath that awakens him at least two nights a week. Most mornings on awakening, he complains of chest tightness. He has a history of asthma since childhood and currently is managed with beclomethasone HFA 160 micrograms twice daily via a spacer and albuterol, with a potency of 90 micrograms per puff, dose to two puffs every six hours as needed and before exercise. ROR's morning peak expiratory flow is consistently in the yellow zone, usually at about 400 liters per minute. His personal best is liters per minute, whereas the evening peak expiratory flow is consistently 550 to 600 liters per minute. So my question to you is, what treatment should be recommended? Many patients with asthma complain of symptoms that awaken them in the night or occur on awakening in the morning. Morning cough with or without bronchospasm may be a clue to nocturnal asthma. Although nocturnal asthma may be appropriately viewed as simply another manifestation of airway inflammation, it is so common and troublesome among asthmatic patients that it deserves special note. Circadian rhythm in peak expiratory flow is exaggerated in patients with asthma. The difference in peak expiratory flow in non-asthmatic patients averages about 8% between 4 p.m., corresponding to the maximal airflow, and 4 a.m., corresponding to the minimal airflow. But in patients with asthma, the average variation can be as high as about 50%. Several mechanisms account for this diurnal variation in peak expiratory flow. The following are examples of factors that contribute to nocturnal asthma. Increased release of inflammatory mediators, increased activity of the parasympathetic nervous system, lower circulating levels of epinephrine, and lower levels of serum cortisol, lowest at about midnight. In addition, for patients whose asthma is triggered by gastroesophageal reflux, this problem is worse at night, but treatment of this problem generally provides only minimal improvement in asthma management. The initial approach to managing nocturnal symptoms is the same as that for overall long-term therapy of persistent asthma, including adequate anti-inflammatory agents. Inhaled corticosteroids are often effective in eliminating or reducing nocturnal asthma, including symptoms and the drop in peak expiratory flow. If low to medium dosages, i.e., correctly inhaled every day, do not eliminate symptoms, combination therapy with long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist, e.g. salmeterol, or formoterol, is indicated. Also, 
The basic asthma treatment principle of good control of concomitant rhinitis and environmental control, especially in the bedroom, e.g., house dust mites, household pets, should be considered in the patient with nocturnal asthma symptoms. Because asthma is primarily an inflammatory disease and nocturnal symptoms are largely caused by airway inflammation, the first drug therapy concern in ROR is to ensure that he is strictly adhering to his beclomethasone therapy and demonstrating excellent inhalation technique. If his use of the medication is optimal, a reasonable approach would be to add long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist therapy, because he is already at a medium inhaled corticosteroid dosage. As part of optimal management of nocturnal asthma, ROR also should be asked about avoiding or minimizing exposure to his asthma triggers, e.g., if he is allergic to cats, is there a cat in the bedroom? Follow-up visits for ROR should verify that the early morning peak expiratory flow and evening peak expiratory flow are staying in the green zone and that symptoms, both during the night and on awakening in the morning, have been eliminated. The next case reads, MBC, a 32-year-old woman with asthma, asks her clinician which over-the-counter medications would be preferred for minor aches and pains. MBC says that she is very sensitive to aspirin, causes severe wheezing. The clinician should counsel the patient regarding the fact that patients with asthma, who are aspirin-sensitive often react to other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs such as ibuprofen by developing asthma symptoms with the first dose. The healthcare professional should suggest acetaminophen. If MBC says that acetaminophen does not give adequate relief of her pain, other options are sulcerlet or consultation with a board-certified allergist with experience in aspirin and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug desensitization. The clinician should also suggest consultation with an allergist regarding evidence that cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitors are safe in aspirin-sensitive asthma. This case also points out the need for health professionals to pay close attention to patient use of non-prescription medications. Although drug-induced asthma may present as relatively mild symptoms in some patients, fatal asthma caused by medicinal agents has been reported numerous times. The most extensive literature on drug-induced asthma involves non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and beta blockers. Other drugs and drug preservatives also can induce symptoms of asthma. The percentage of asthma patients reported to be aspirin-sensitive ranges from 4% to 28%. Clinical manifestations of aspirin sensitivity include rhinorrhea, mild wheezing, or severe, life-threatening shortness of breath. Once the reaction has occurred, there is a refractory period of 2 to 5 days. If an asthma patient is aspirin sensitive, it is likely that the patient also will react to most other non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs. Aspirin and other non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs share common mechanisms involving the arachidonic acid pathways, including inhibition of cyclooxygenase, which results in more rapid synthesis and overproduction of leukotrienes. Not surprisingly, because leukotrienes are an important part of the mechanism of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug-induced asthma, inhibitors of 5-lipoxygenase such as zelutin are generally, but not always, effective in blocking this response. Similarly, leukotriene receptor antagonists such as zephyrlucast and montelukast are generally, but not always, effective in blocking aspirin-induced asthma. Because most patients with asthma do not react to aspirin and other non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, the NIH guidelines recommend avoiding these agents only in patients with known sensitivity. In addition, 
Patients with severe persistent asthma or nasal polyps should be counseled regarding the risks associated with these drugs. In patients with known sensitivity, acetaminophen or sulsalet is recommended for headaches and relatively minor pain. For patients who are sensitive, but who need to take aspirin, e.g., after myocardial infarction or a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug, e.g., arthritis, it is possible to desensitize the patient, and daily use then prevents further reaction. When discussing drug-induced asthma, the other major consideration is beta blockers. These agents should be used with great caution in patients with asthma. Because even beta-1 adrenergic blockers lose selectivity as dosages are increased, they, as well as non-selective beta blockers, should be avoided in most patients. Furthermore, ophthalmic timolol has been reported several times to cause fatal asthma and should absolutely be avoided in patients with a history of asthma. Other beta blocker eye drops, e.g., beta exolol, have been reported to have less propensity to induce asthma, but all have some risk. Two notable exceptions to using beta blockers in patients with asthma are patients who are post-myocardial infarction and patients with heart failure. Because beta blockers prolong life after a myocardial infarction and improve the care of patients with heart failure, benefits versus risks should be weighed. Risks outweigh benefits if a patient has severe persistent asthma. If a post-myocardial infarction patient has intermittent asthma or well-controlled mild persistent or moderate persistent asthma with optimal management, a low dosage of atenolol 50 mg per day is a reasonable consideration in which benefits may outweigh risks. Patients with asthma have been shown to respond to inhaled beta-2 agonists when receiving this dosage of atenolol. Although low dosages of beta blockers are not proven to prolong life after a myocardial infarction, some studies suggest efficacy of lower dosages. For patients with heart failure, metoprolol CR or XL is the cardio-selective beta blocker approved in the United States whereas carvedilol, which has non-selective beta blocker as well as alpha blocking properties, can worsen asthma symptoms or cause fatal asthma. If a patient with asthma is given a beta blocker and initially reports no symptoms, subsequent exacerbations may not respond well to administration of usual doses of a beta agonist. The drug of choice for beta blocker induced bronchospasm is ipratropium. A more subtle risk with beta blockers involves the adult with allergic rhinitis and a family history of asthma. If this individual is given a beta blocker for hypertension, symptoms of asthma could be induced, especially if another trigger is introduced such as running in cold, dry air. The next case reads, CMC is a 36-year-old woman admitted to the hospital for asthma. This is her second hospitalization in the past two years, and she has had three accident and emergency department visits during the same period. She also complains of nocturnal awakenings at least four nights per week and is bothered that she is gaining weight because she cannot exercise. Lack of exercise is also troubling her because her five-year-old daughter wants her to go outside and play with her. CMC has been inhaling fluticasone 44 micrograms one puff twice daily without a spacer for years along with frequent as needed albuterol. CMC carefully controls her home environment. So my question to you is, what could her clinicians do to improve her outcomes, including quality of life? CMC needs a reassessment of her long-term management considering her very poor outcomes during the past two years. First, her clinicians need to establish a partnership with her in education regarding asthma and its management. Clearly, 
She needs a dosage adjustment with her anti-inflammatory therapy, because her dosage is too low and she is experiencing symptoms of poor asthma control. Given her recent history, she should be treated initially with medium-dose inhaled corticosteroid and a long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist, e.g., combination budesonide formoterol, combination mametasone formoterol, or combination fluticasone salmeterol. CMC should have the importance of daily controller therapy stressed, including the need for strict adherence and proper inhalation technique. CMC needs a written asthma action plan and an emergency supply of prednisone, i.e., to use when her peak expiratory flow is in the red zone and unresponsive to albuterol. CMC should be told to expect a reduced need for albuterol. Numerous studies have documented that applying the principles of the evidence-based guidelines results in improved clinical outcomes, and many of these studies have been summarized in EPR3. Several studies in the United States have documented that pharmacists who are highly knowledgeable of EPR3 and who work closely with patients and physicians improve outcomes, including reduced accident and emergency department visits and hospitalizations. These successful studies involved highly motivated pharmacists, who were asthma experts based in university-affiliated clinics or in large private health maintenance organizations. A randomized controlled trial based in community pharmacies in Canada with specially trained pharmacists has also shown very positive outcomes for patients with asthma. Another randomized controlled trial based in chain drug stores in the United States, with staff pharmacists did not show a benefit related to attempts at asthma care. Unfortunately, the level of training and incentives did not appear optimal, and the authors pointed out that the staff pharmacists were not universally enthusiastic about the program. The authors also described their intervention as cumbersome, for the pharmacists. Further study is needed to assess asthma care in this setting when pharmacists are optimally trained, given appropriate incentives, and enthusiastic about the program. Many studies outside the United States have shown that community pharmacists are helpful in asthma management. When assessing the effect of comprehensive management on clinical outcomes, quality of life measures should be assessed a validated questionnaire, the asthma control test as well as reduction in accident and emergency department visits and hospitalizations. To achieve optimal outcomes, attention to each of the four major components of management is required. Objective assessment, environmental control, pharmacologic therapy, and patient education as a partnership. Examples of areas that pose special challenges for inner-city patients include psychosocial factors, underuse of controller medications, and passive cigarette smoke. As part of overall management to improve outcomes, studies have emphasized again the importance of good inhalation technique with inhaled corticosteroid and education in the use of peak flow meters. CMC returns to the clinic in two months and is elated, because she is sleeping through the night and not waking up with shortness of breath. In addition, she is beginning to exercise again, which makes her and her child very happy. CMC has had no further accident and emergency department visits. So my next question to you is, what should the clinician do at this point? Optimal asthma management that improves outcomes is a continuous process of education and reassessment of the overall therapy. Observation of CMC using her peak flow meter and inhalation devices on each clinic visit is important and should be routine. Having CMC verbalizes her understanding of the role of the inhaled corticosteroid plus long-acting inhaled beta-2 agonist versus albuterol and the action plan with crisis prednisone is important. Despite her current optimism, 
Asking CMC about her current asthma concerns is important. During the next month or two, a trial of slowly stepping down the inhaled corticosteroid dosage to a medium dose should be attempted. Finally, CMC needs continued partnership with her clinician. CMC is in the clinic two years later, reflecting with her clinician about her total elimination of accident and emergency department visits and hospitalizations, as well as her improved quality of life. Her management initiated 24 months ago has continued, including environmental control, controller therapy tailored for her, as needed albuterol, early morning peak expiratory flow monitoring, and partnership with her clinician. Unfortunately, CMC forgot to get an influenza vaccine last October and became ill with influenza in early March. Although this episode only slightly worsened her asthma symptoms, when she was almost recovered from the flu, she went to the grocery store and breathed secondhand smoke unexpectedly. In addition, early spring tree and grass pollen was affecting her allergic rhinitis. By the time she got back to her house, she was wheezing and her peak expiratory flow was in the yellow zone, but it responded to three puffs of albuterol. CMC asks what she should have done if this series of events had resulted in her peak expiratory flow decreasing to the red zone. CMC needs to be re-educated regarding the action plan based on symptoms and peak expiratory flow values. Referring back to the written plan for doses of albuterol and, if needed, oral corticosteroid therapy is important. Emphasizing the need for annual influenza vaccination in October is important. In addition, Patients with asthma equal to or older than 19 years of age should receive pneumococcal vaccine, and patients equal to or older than 65 years of age should receive pneumococcal conjugate vaccine reinforcement of the importance of continued preventive therapy that has given such remarkable success is appropriate for CMC and reassuring her that despite this minor setback, she is in control of her asthma. The clinician should continue to work with her to further tailor the therapy, including control of rhinitis, to maintain optimal outcomes at the lowest dosages and the simplest possible regimen. Research has further emphasized the goal of simplified regimens and achieving the lowest effective doses of anti-inflammatory therapy. CMC is in the clinic a few months later. She is continuing to have excellent control of her asthma and allergic rhinitis. CMC asks her healthcare professional for her opinion of herbal remedies for asthma as well as other non-traditional approaches to treatment. Complementary and alternative approaches that have been used in the treatment of asthma include black tea, coffee, ephedra, marijuana, dried ivy leaf extract, acupuncture, meditation, and yoga. Despite the widespread use of alternative medications for chronic conditions, the clinician should discuss with CMC that there is no established scientific basis for their use in the management of asthma. One study found that use of herbal treatments was associated with reduced adherence to inhaled corticosteroid therapy and poor outcomes among inner-city patients with asthma. Complementary alternative medicine cannot be recommended as a substitute for the drug therapy recommended by EPR3 and other medical literature based on randomized controlled studies. While not a complementary alternative therapy, one non-drug marketed treatment, bronchial thermoplasty, has been demonstrated to be efficacious in the management of severe, refractory asthma. So there you have it, our highly esteemed viewers and listeners, that brings us to the end of this video. If it benefited you in any way, kindly remember to give it a thumbs up, to like it and to share it widely with your peers. Please leave your comments at the bottom.
and if you haven't yet done so, I humbly urge you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I would like to promise you all that the very, very best is yet to come. Thank you very much for viewing this video. On behalf of our senior colleague, Dr. Nath Arawa, I sincerely appreciate your partnership, continued support and kind collaboration. We look forward to interacting with you in the next video, which will be part 361.